With the recent news of Vanessa Lau. Vanessa Lau. Vanessa Lau. Vanessa Lau. Vanessa has been a leader in the online space. Last year, I decided to leave social media and go ghost mode because I did it pretty much at the height of my career. I had half a million subscribers on YouTube, a quarter million followers on Instagram, a multiple seven figure online course business. I was finally speaking on stages. I was also popping off. Like my channel was doing really well. It was getting a lot of views, but I ultimately decided that this life ain't for me and I peaced out and I shocked my corner of the internet. There's no stopping me now. I know my shots just sit down. Money's all over me. I'm called to be rich and be free. What is up, you guys? Welcome back to my channel. I am Ebony Yvonne. Welcome to Soul Shark Land. This is my internet home where I help you go from confused to the ethical cash generating boss that we both know you are meant to be. In today's video, it's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to do a reaction video to Vanessa Lau's Why I Quit video. Um, this is my first time doing a reaction and I have been wanting to do a review or analysis of this just to kind of shed light on some of the things that happen in the online coaching industry and things that you should be aware of. If you're thinking about becoming a coach, if you are a coach, things you should think about when you're actually coaching your own clients. And I want to get into all of that in this video. Um, and I wanted to go do an analysis breakdown and go like point by point, but it has been over a week and I have not had time to sit down and do this video. So I was like, you know what, why don't I just do this reaction style? That way I can watch the video and as I go through, I can point out the things that I'm seeing and then that way I can get this video to you guys a lot faster, right? So this video is like 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to watch it at one and a half speed just so that we can get through it more quickly. Maybe in editing, I might like slow pieces down or something or po post a normal clip. But I want to get through this without it feeling like we are be sitting here for hours. Okay, so I'm going to head, go ahead, play the video, and then I'm going to tell you what I see and things that I notice as red flags. If there's green flags, I'll tell you that too. But follow along with me through this video. If you see things that are red flags, or if you have some key things that you want to point out, feel free to do that down in the comments below this video. Otherwise, let's jump right in and see what Vanessa has to say about why she abruptly quit her business and well she said she was going on hiatus but something else we'll figure out why she quit and what to expect because she's back now i don't know we'll see Last year, I decided to leave social media and go ghost mode. I put up this announcement to my followers, letting them know that I was taking an indefinite break. I had no idea when I was coming back. I had really tough conversations with my clients and also my team members, and I ultimately decided to dissolve so, my business. So already, it's interesting that she said she was taking an indefinite break and she didn't know when she was coming back because that in itself is kind of incongruent. incongruent. If you are taking an indefinite break, that means it's indefinite, like forever, forever, ever, 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 right? So um, if you take an indefinite break, then there's no anticipation of you ever coming back. That's just how I see it. And even when she made the initial post saying that she was going on hiatus, to me, which I guess you could come back from a hiatus, but typically like um, in like the educational industry or some corporate professionals, people will say, oh, I took a sabbatical, right? And when you take a sabbatical, that means you're taking time off to step away from your position, your role, but you do plan to come back at some time. So I think maybe the appropriate thing to say would be sabbatical, because if you're taking an indefinite hiatus, that means you're never coming back. But anyways. Now, that was over a year ago, and it's crazy to think about, not just because I did it, but because I did it pretty much at the height of my career. I had half a million subscribers on YouTube, a quarter million followers on Instagram, a multiple seven-figure online course business. I was finally speaking on stages. I was also popping off. Like, my channel was doing really well. It was getting a lot of views. But I ultimately decided that this life ain't for me, and I peaced out, and I shocked my corner of the internet. There was a lot of speculation of what happened. Did I get sued? Uh, it's interesting to see if she goes into 
Um, she says, this life wasn't for me, so I peaced out. So what aspects of this life wasn't for you? Was it the speaking on stages? Was it the coaching aspect? Was it scaling? What? So let's see if she gets into that in this video. Do Am I pregnant? And so today I'm going to share the actual story coming from the source. And I also want to share the reflections that I've had this past year. Because having a year to yourself and not being on social media changes you. And it allows you to really see things from a very different perspective. And I agree with that. So um, if you are new to the channel, you're just not finding me. Hey, how you doing? What is up? But I am actually a digital nomad. And I myself stepped away from social media back in 2022. Um, so at the time of me making this video, it has been almost two years since I stopped using social media to market my business. And the reason why I personally stepped away from social media is because when you're in the online space especially if you're like a social media influencer if you're a coach where you have a personal brand and a lot of your business is based around you you become the content right and so for me i found myself being in a place of i created this business so that i could actually have more freedom that's always how people package it have time freedom financial freedom and when it came to me actually working in my business i got to a point i want to say like in 2020 between 2020 2021 where i was like literally everything that i do every action that i take i'm thinking about how can i use this for content i'm thinking about how can i leverage this in my business how can i turn this into a social media post so for me it became very overwhelming like I remember being tra like traveling with family or like we go out to eat or like we have a cake or something and I'm like wait don't cut it yet I gotta take a picture for the gram or I'm like wait let's take a picture y'all wait let me get a selfie wait let me do a reel over here and then my family would be like girl like we ain't got time for you to be making all these videos we are trying to live in this moment and so I started realizing that because I was so focused on building a personal brand that a lot of the um, content that I was creating, I never actually got to enjoy that moment because I was so focused on creating the content or getting the picture so that I could post it on social media. So even with me, I stopped using Instagram two years ago because I don't have to worry about posting nothing. And in that time, I literally, 2022, I traveled through Southeast Asia. Um, I went to eight different countries. Last year, I went to, what, another six countries. And none of that stuff made it to the gram. But I have the most vivid memories when I think back to what I did when I was in Bali or what I did when I was in Vietnam, what I did in Dubai. Like, I can go back to that moment and feel the presence of being there, riding ATVs, going to the rice fields, you know, going on boat cruises and things like that versus before when I was so focused on just creating content, I think back and I'd be like, dang, like, I don't even remember this. Or like, I vaguely remember this, but it's because I wasn't enjoying the moment. I was so focused on capturing the content of the moment, if that makes sense. So what she's saying in this part is totally relatable. And I think more people need to talk about this. And especially if you have a personal brand, how you can balance being the content and also being present in the moment. And so in order for me to tell the story though, we gotta go back to 2018. All right, welcome to 2018, the year that I decided to quit my corporate job to pursue my decade long dream of being an- So that's interesting to me. So I guess she's Canadian. Is Vanessa Lau Canadian? Um, it's interesting that she said she quit her corporate job to um, be a social media influencer because I'm not that familiar with Vanessa Lau. I really didn't consume a lot of her content, but I ha have a lot of peers or clients that watch Vanessa. And I just remember vaguely of her saying that she went from being like a barista or something. I don't know if she worked at Starbucks or another coffee shop, but I remember her saying that she went from being a barista to actually um, building, I think at that time, maybe a six figure business or maybe it was seven. So it's interesting that now she's saying she had a corporate job. And to me, that in itself is kind of giving me insight into the manipulative marketing tactics that people can use. 
because everyone likes to market their business as if they're just this regular person with no skills, no assets, no knowledge, and they were able to go from being a barista, working at Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or wherever, and then they were able to build this six or seven figure business with no skills. And because they're just a regular, regular person, just like you, you can do this too, right? So it's interesting. It looks like she worked at L'Oreal maybe. So it's interesting to see she's now saying that she had this corporate job that she quit in order to do this. I would be interested to know what what her specific position was at that job. If she worked in marketing, if it was like administrative or what. You guys know I used to work in HR. I used to be an HR training instructor. So that has helped me tremendously in my business in ways that like I cannot even explain. But a lot of times when I'm having conversations with clients, they'll say, well, how are you able to do this? How do you know this? And I tell people before I even stepped into entrepreneurship, I already had a leg up on a lot of other people in the industry simply because of my educational background. I do have my bachelor's in business management. I do have a master's. I have an MBA as well as a master's in human resources in healthcare administration. I worked as an HR training instructor. So me going into coaching, I'm a certified trainer trainer. So when I started coaching, I had coaching techniques. I knew how to, how to create content for adult learners. So if you don't have that same knowledge and background, you're going to have a longer learning curve in order to get to the results that you want because not only are you trying to grow your business, but you're also learning the skills that it takes to be able to build that business. Influencer. What's up everyone? Welcome back to my channel, the number one place for new coaches, content creators, and entrepreneurs. Now nowadays, I realize that we have called influencers creators now because it's less cringe to say creators than it is influencers, but let's be real, I wanted to be an influencer and specifically, I wanted to be a YouTuber. I was really, really inspired by the 2009 OG YouTubers like Michelle Fawn, I like Whaley, Jay Loves Mac, and by the way, if you know any of these women, you are my people. Anywho, I decided I don't to know any of those my dream people. of being a YouTuber and I quickly realized that it is not cute, not making money, and so I decided to be a coffee barista instead of going back to the corporate grind while building up my channel. Soon enough, after a few months, my channel started taking off and I was building an audience. Okay, so that's interesting. She brings up being a coffee barista, and I guess it was in Starbucks. I don't know what this place is. But so basically, she probably quit her corporate job at L'Oreal. I'm assuming it was L'Oreal without a plan. It was just like, oh, I'm going to quit my job and be a YouTuber. And then realize, number one, it, being on YouTube, it, it takes longevity, right? It takes a long time for you to qualify for the YouTube Partner Program. It takes a long time for you to grow your audience so you can actually start monetizing it and generating revenue, whether that's from AdSense, whether that's from you um, having affiliate marketing, whether that's from you selling your own products and services. At the end of the day, and I have this conversation with, with so many clients, prospective clients, people that I just meet when I'm out and about, um, people will talk about how they try all these different things to make money online or to get rich. Um, people will sell insurance, right? We all know about the MLMs. Um, people will start a business with affiliate market, drop shipping, they'll start coaching, and then they do all of these things and none of these things are successful. And the reason why is because regardless of what it is that you do, you have to build an audience first. If you're going to sell insurance, you have to build a network of people who are looking for insurance. If you're going to be a coach, you have to look for people who need your expertise of the area that you're coaching around. If you want to be a social media influencer, you have to grow your audience and build influence. And I think that's something that people really like don't understand when it comes to social media influence influencers the key word is influence if you just have a huge following on social media you're just popular right influence comes in when you actually have influence over your audience to where when you recommend things to them when you tell them things they're going to be inspired they're going to take action they're going to buy things right because you say, oh, I use this hair care product on my locks and it makes it look 
look so good and grow so fast. You're like, dang, if she's using this product, it's making her hair grow like that. I want to be able to use it too, right? I need that for my hair. That's influence. But if people watch your content and I'm telling people about a new product or service and I'm like, hey, y'all go try this. And they're, and everyone's like, your hair is so cute. Oh my God, you cute, sis. All right, that's cute though. And people are looking at it for entertainment value. There's no conversion. That is not influence. That is just popularity, okay? So there's a big difference that people don't actually talk about. But I realized that, hey, these views and this AdSense revenue, like it's not really doing it for me. And so I stumbled upon the world of online coaching and online business and online courses. It's interesting to me that she talks about growing her channel and her, her videos starting to take off, but she wasn't making money directly from YouTube itself because she was only making like, in this example, 313 from AdSense revenue. And that's something that people kind of feel is very misleading. People will sit there and say that, oh, you can make a six figures with your YouTube channel. Now, there are ways that you can do that. But when people promote this, it's as if all you have to do is post videos and then you're going to generate all this revenue. When for most YouTubers that I know personally that have large channels, the bulk of their revenue does not come from AdSense alone. The bulk of their revenue comes from super chats, super thanks. It comes from having a channel membership. It comes from them selling products and services. It comes from them offering coaching and things like that. So it's the sales and marketing ecosystem that they built around their YouTube channel that's actually generating that revenue. It's not coming directly from just them having a YouTube channel and the AdSense. I specifically listen to a lot of Amy Porterfield. I listen to a lot of James Wedmore. I listen to a lot of Erin May Henry and Sunny Leonard Doozy. And so I was really inspired to not just be a creator, but now to become a coach. And as my audience grew, a lot of demand grew for people that wanted to work privately with me. And so I did it. I worked with clients. I taught them everything I knew about social media and what I was learning as I was building my business. And soon enough, I was booked out of paid clients. And I realized that, hey, there is a cap to this. And so what I did to scale up was I decided to package everything that I was teaching my clients and more into a course. And that course was called the Boss Grant Academy. Now it was really successful. And this is where we get into to the the coach to course to mastermind pipeline i already know where this is going so <laughs> sorry y'all i did not mean to laugh at this but listen i fell for this myself when i first started coaching i started out with one-on-one -on -one coaching and then i started creating group coaching programs and courses and i feel like when it comes to the coaching industry it is kind of um, marketed and it is positioned to make you believe as a coach that you have to do all these things. You start out with one-on-one -on -one coaching, but if you want to scale your business, you, you have to create a group coaching program, go from one-on-one -on -one to group. And then if you really want to be able to scale that, you want to turn your coach group coaching program into a course so that it runs on autopilot. You could sell it 24 seven, right? And it doesn't require a lot of your time. But the truth is, there are so many different ways to structure your coaching business, your coaching program, and not everything works for everybody. Like, for example, I don't know what Vanessa Lau's position was when she worked in corporate, when she worked for L'Oreal, but I'm guessing she probably did not work in HR. She didn't have a training background. Maybe she worked in marketing. Maybe she did their social media. I don't know. But to go from that world into coaching other people without any skills is crazy to me because I doubt she had any technical coaching skills or um, took the time to learn those. A lot of the coaching programs that you see today, they really are heavily focused on how to create something and, ha and halfway create stuff. And then also on how you can um, sell it and market it, right? They really don't get into um what coaching techniques to use what instructional design skills you need to have how you need to have your own leadership scout style and how you can leverage that when you're interacting with different types of clients because your clients are not going to be cookie cutter in one size so you may have some clients that come in and 
they're self-directed. You can give them a action step and say, hey, do this, explain how what it is that you're doing them, give, it, give them context around it, and then they can go do it by themselves. But then you're also gonna have some clients or students who, you know, they need a little bit more support. They're not as self-directed. You have to give them a little bit more coaching. You have to affirm them as they go through the process. And so a lot of people don't understand like how you can navigate your clients and their learning styles with your teaching style and different coaching techniques and instructional design. And so that is literally why I created my Coach Correct program. It's almost like a trainer trainer for coaches to learn coaching techniques, to learn instructional design, to create more effective programs. And what most people do is just like, oh, just teach what you know without even knowing the skill of teaching or coaching. I first launched it, I made $200,000 and I posted this video of myself literally crying to strangers on the internet because this was the most money that I had ever made in my entire life. I'm... I'm so honored and happy to announce that my business has officially hit six figures today. And a year ago, I was in the cubicle asking myself how I could get to this point. I'm sorry, I didn't, feel, didn't think I'd cry. Like a year ago, I was literally asking myself, how can I get that for my life? And today I just did it. And I'm so happy. And it was all fine and dandy. It was, it was a really fun time, if I'm being honest with you. Emotional but manipulation. More and more That's all I have to say about that. And the course took a whole form of its own. I could no longer manage that many clients in a course. And so now that course became a team. And that team basically turned me into a manager. And more and more people started enrolling in your course after you got on social media crying about how you made $200,000 because they are like, dang, I want to do that too. And this is why I tell people, I have a video I'll post up in the cards where I talk, I talk about the dangers of income report marketing. This is something I used to do in my business and I stopped in, I want to say like 2020, 2021. I stopped using my own sales and revenue um, milestones as marketing tools in my business because when you were saying, oh, I built a six-figure business, a seven-figure business, I made five figures in one month, then people are making a decision to work with you based on the, the hopes that they can make that same amount of money too. When everyone is different, your business models are going to be different. So the amount of sales or revenue that you can generate is going to be different depending on your skill set, your business model, what you offer, the offer, the audience that you serve. And people don't talk about that. So, um, Vanessa may have been able to leverage her platform to make um, 200, and we know she eventually goes to, I think, 8 million. I know it was seven figures. But that is not what is true for the average entrepreneur, small business owner. And I haven't looked at the statistics recently, but I know last year when I looked at the average amount of revenue that women-owned business in the U U.S. specifically earned, it was less than $30,000. So of all the entrepreneurs that you see on social media making these claims saying they're making six and seven figures a lot of them is lying <laughs> okay but then also it's not typical when you look at the world of entrepreneurship small businesses um as a whole the actual percentage of businesses specifically by women entrepreneurs that make over six figures i want to say it's a, like six or seven percent and the percentage of women-owned businesses that make over seven figures, so a million plus, is less than 2%. So I think it's important to share those statistics because that gives you more of a realistic snapshot of what's possible. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't make six figures, you can't make seven figures, but it's going to take a lot of skill, talent, and sometimes luck in order to get to that point. Not everybody is going to be able to make six figures or make seven figures, because if that's the case, it would be a lot more successful entrepreneurs.
And so now that course became a team and that team basically turned me into a manager. It also came with a lot of deadlines. I was no longer a solopreneur. It came with a lot of responsibility. It came with a lot of pressure and it came with a lot of promises because when someone joined the company, they obviously want a steady paycheck and they also want to have career growth. And so now my little YouTube channel was no longer just something that was for me. It was a company that people were working at. I remember the day that one of my employees actually put on their LinkedIn that they worked at the Boss Grand Academy. And I was like, at the time that my channel had escalated into something that was beyond what I had even imagined for myself because I was so reactive to the growth. In order to keep growing, I just kept adding and throwing spaghetti at the wall because it was my first time doing so many of these things. And before I knew it, like I said, my little YouTube channel had turned into a full-fledged company that people were working at. And it's not even the fact that people worked at the company, it's the fact that I felt that people heavily relied on the company. Maybe that's not true, but as a business owner, that's the pressure that I felt. I feel like at some point, with that pressure, it caused me to constantly worry about the future instead of being present. And as I'm actually reviewing the video right now, it's my first time in a long time, even re-watching that video of me hitting six figures. And post filming this video, as I'm even like watching it over, I'm like, wow, I changed so much. I used to be grateful for every single milestone to the point where it would move me to tears. And somewhere along the lines, that gratitude started to dwindle because I was just no longer present. I was always worried about the future and feeling like I needed to do more and that everything I did wasn't enough. And so anyways, like you'll see more <laughs> if you watch the video, but I wanted to let you guys know that even I'm having a certain epiphany about this. Now, you would think from the tone of this video that at that time I hated being a boss and I hated my team and I hated having a course, but that is farther from the truth. I love, That's what it sounds I love like. the fact that I wasn't alone anymore. I love the fact that I wasn't a solopreneur and I actually felt like I had friends. And that's one mistake is when you think your employees are your friends. But anyways, I digress. That's a whole nother video. But I thought I had friends. I finally had friends I could bounce ideas off of. I finally had friends that actually cared about my business. And not only this, I love the fact that we had the course because we were able to scale it up. Thanks to the team and thanks to the course, I was able to make my first million dollars online. And within a few short years, I think within four years, that one million dollars turned into eight million dollars. And so what I'm trying to say is that it worked. Having the team scaling up into a course worked. And when things work, people start to notice and you start receiving invitations. I received invitations to speak on people's podcasts. I received invitations to be in their masterminds. I received invitations to speak on their stages. And through those invitations, you get to meet successful people in real life. And a lot of times those people are more successful than you. And here's the first trap that I found myself in. And that was a comparison trap because you would think that it was awesome meeting all these people, but truthfully, when I met these people, especially in real life, that was the height of my imposter syndrome. There's one thing to compare yourself to people on social media. There's another to actually meet them in real life and realize that, wow, they're dope. Like they're doing a lot of cool things. And so to paint the picture for you, I met people like Jasmine Starr, who I've looked up to for a really long time. I learned that she was building software, which is so cool. I met Cody Sanchez when I first met her. She didn't even have a YouTube channel. And she told me that she actually started her YouTube channel after hearing my talk and realizing that she was missing out on an opportunity not being on YouTube. And soon enough, because she's so smart, she scaled up to a whole content team. And now her channel has completely surpassed mine. She's crushing it. I met Layla Hormozzi. You all know the Hormozis. They acquire businesses. I met YouTubers that have over a million subscribers. I also was in a room full of people that were making millions of dollars a month thanks to their mastermind. I don't know any of these people, <laughs> but um, I understand what she's saying about the comparison trap. And that's another reason why I got off social media as well, because often if you're in the coaching industry and you see other coaches, even if you don't follow other coaches, the way the Instagram algorithm is designed not only does it send you content that you, you interact with, but it sends you the type of content that you post. If you're, po if you're posting about coaching, if you're posting about online marketing, digital marketing strategies, then the Instagram algorithm is also going to send you that type of content. And so if you even if you're not following other people in your industry, the algorithm is designed to show you that content anyways because it's like, oh, you have an interest in this. And so oftentimes you can see other coaches doing things and you can say, oh man, like I like that or I should be doing that. Or man, this person is really going at it. They really got it going on. They have all their stuff together. And I can tell you from experience as someone who, number one, used to be uh, in the coaching in industry myself, I started out career coaching and then I transitioned into business coaching and then I transitioned from coaching altogether to being a business manager where instead of me coaching people, I pretty much work as an entrepreneur behind the scenes in a lot of businesses of six and seven figure coaches and behind the scenes working with companies what i have personally realized is regardless if the person is a solopreneur 
if they have a team a lot of these businesses are busting at the seams they do not have their systems together they do not have processes in place and that's pretty much why they bring me in right is to create some of these things but behind the scenes i have seen some of the craziest things like i understand i joke with my friends all the time and i tell them like i am convinced that some of my clients have me sign non-disclosure agreements particularly just so that you can't talk about how bad and horrible their business practices are, their business processes and systems are, because some of the things that I have seen, like when you see a lot of these big, big name people that when you see them on social media, it's all glitz and glam behind the scenes it ain't that okay not what the least i also was in a room full of people that were making millions of dollars a month thanks to their masterminds and so what i learned is that sometimes when you join these masterminds and when you go to these events if you're not careful and if you don't have a strong mindset yourself you can easily start seeing the things that you haven't done and that you haven't achieved and that's what happened to me when i started meeting more and more successful people i started to feel like what i was building what i had just simply wasn't enough I wasn't good enough and I needed to do more in order to be at their level, whether it was their level of revenue, their level of social media following or their level of operations. While it was really cool to meet these super old I would be interested to know what Vanessa's um, human design is. I bet she's probably a generator, maybe even a manifesting generator. But I wonder if um, her head area is colored in or if it's open and the reason why I say that is so for me, I literally have really been getting into human design and studying the Zodiac and stuff and shifting to restructure my business around my human design. And so even in my human design chart, my head space is open. And when your head space is open, what that means is you typically consume because it's open, you consume intellectual stuff, inspiration, from the things around you and the things that you see. And if you're not careful, it could be easy for you to adopt the ideas of other people. And so for me, as someone who is a generator and who has an open headspace, I have to always be mindful of that because I can see something and be like, oh, like I can see how I can do that and I can do it better. I can do this, 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 this. Or like someone could say they're using a specific marketing strategy or they have a mastermind, they have a course. And I'm like, oh, I need to have a course too. Oh, I need to start my own mastermind. So those are just things that you have to be mindful of. I want to do a completely separate video of um, human design and how I'm restructuring my video. So if it's up already, it'll be in the cards. If not, It'll be coming soon. <laughs> Meet these super successful people. It also made me feel like absolute shit. And it made me wow. feel like I needed to be at their level to paint the picture for you. I remember I was at an event. It was hosted. That's crazy for Vanessa to be at that point to where you have, I don't know at this point when she's doing this, if she's at six figures or if she's already scaled to seven figures, but to have accomplished so much and still feel like your your shit is absolutely crazy to be at that level. Um, it sounds like she has a lot of insecurities too. By Neil Patel and Eric Sue, and we could ask any question that we wanted. And the question that I asked was, hey Neil, I'm interested in starting an agency. How do I go about doing that? The truth is, is I don't even want an agency, but I wanted to say that I was going to start an agency because saying it made me feel powerful. It made me feel worthy. It made me feel good enough to be in the same room as these people. And when I learned- <laughs> So, Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> um so i did a video a while back uh, a couple months ago or a month or so ago where i reviewed i don't know if you guys have seen the what is it escaping twin flames documentary there's two there's one on netflix i reviewed the one on netflix and i talk about how um everything in the escaping twin flames docuseries highlights all the things that are wrong with the online coaching industry but there's a documentary on Netflix. There's also one on Hulu, on Hulu. But it's interesting that she said that when she's in these spaces, she felt like, oh, I have to ask this question about having an agency, not because I actually want one, but because I feel like that's what I needed to say to feel powerful. And 
in a lot of online coaching communities, it, I always tell people they are very cultish to where it is almost this group think mentality. And everyone has to think the same way. Everyone has to do the same things and follow the same roadmap. And that really strips away your creativity, your individuality, and you being able to actually build a business that is unique and that stands out from other businesses because you're just doing, you hire a coach and you do what they tell you to do instead of them actually coaching you to tap into your skill set, to tap into your expertise and say, okay, because you have the skill set, because you have these strengths, this expertise, these are the ways that you can build your business and basically helping to guide you down the right path that's unique to you and your business and your skills. Instead, it's almost like herding cattle to where everyone is going into the same stall and then generates the same result. Is that when you don't have a strong sense of self, it is so easy mm -hmm. to accidentally adopt other people's dreams as your own. And when I reflect back on my journey, <laughs> I started my business, I just or I accidentally that. stumbled upon my business, I should say, in my early 20s. And being in my early 20s, all I cared about was being liked. And so... And this may be an unpopular opinion, but when you're in your early 20s, I don't think you should be coaching anyone because you don't even have the expertise or the experience, the leadership skills to actually coach someone because you don't have the life experience. You haven't been through anything at 20, right? You you don't even have... And that's crazy to me because I see a lot of co a lot of business coaches specifically that are like 21, 22. And I'm like... How old were you when you started a business? If you started a business when you were like six, maybe even 16, okay, you may know a thing or two. But if you literally created a business six months ago, you haven't had to, you haven't had any challenges, you haven't hit any roadblocks, you haven't had to pivot and navigate changes in the economy, industry changes, then I don't think you're in a place to actually coach other people. Just because something worked for you doesn't mean it's going to work for someone else. Being new and inexperienced and insecure and not knowing who I was. When I became a boss, I didn't want to be any boss. I wanted to be a cool boss. And so I spent a lot of time pleasing my employees because I wanted them to be my friends. I wanted them to like me. And when it came to creating content, not only was a lot of time spent pleasing the algorithm, but it was also pleasing 700,000 strangers. I love you guys. But at the end of the day, I felt a lot of pressure to show up for you all. And especially being in the niche of education and social media and having a bigger channel, I was put on a pedestal as an expert, as a guru. And so constantly I felt like I had to put that mask on. And I put a lot of so are you saying you weren't an expert or a guru? And I put a lot of pressure That's on to be that for you guys and to be that guru for my clients and to have all the answers. But what I realized is that for a lot of my career, and in fact, if I'm honest with myself, for a lot of my life, it has always been a performance for other people. And sometimes when that happens and your whole life is basically a performance because you want to please others, you'll wake up one day and realize that you don't even know who you are. Now, of course, hindsight is 2020, and what I know now is definitely not what I knew back then. And so I kept going because I didn't ever feel like I was enough, and I wasn't freaking grateful for the business that I had built. So already what I'm hearing her say is that she built um, the business that other people wanted her to have and not necessarily the business that she wanted to create. And I wasn't freaking grateful for the business that I had built. And so I kept adding more and more and more and more shit. I added more people. I added more projects. I added more launches. I added more offerings. I did everything that I could to just do things bigger and better in every step of the way because I wanted it to be worthy and I wanted to be liked and I wanted to be cool. And by the way, all of this was pressure that I created in my head. And so I'm not blaming anyone that I met. I'm not blaming any mentor. I'm not blaming no no vanessa don't do that it is the mentors that you had in your life listen no the system is designed that way you guys wait a minute let me back this up back 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 it up let me back this up For offerings i did everything that i could to just do things bigger and better in every step of the way because i wanted it to be worthy and i wanted to be liked and i wanted to be cool and by the way all of this was pressure that I created in my head. And so I'm not blaming anyone that I met. I'm not blaming any mentor. I'm not blaming any clients. I'm so I don't like the fact that she's saying, by the way, all of this was pressure that I created in my head because you didn't create this pressure yourself. The coaches, the mentors, the, um, you know, being on social media in general, all of that influenced the perspective and the ideas that you thought that you had to do these things as a coach. 
as a coach, you got to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you want to be able to scale and stop trading your um, dollars for hours, then you need, you need a group coaching program. You need a course. You have to have a mastermind charging people probably thousands of dollars. Like the system that you're in is created and designed to make you feel like you have to have all these things. And I don't like the fact that even in her, you know, I expected more from Vanessa. I'm not going to lie. In this video, I thought she was going to come back and she was going to have these reflections to say, man, like I was influenced to believe that I had to have these things. I had to do these things. And even in this video, she is still blaming herself. And this is what you see in a lot of cultish communities, especially coaching communities, where people will make it seem like, which in this case, she's successful. But a lot of times when you're in a coaching program and you don't see results, you don't get the things that were promised to you. Like if they have a program that says, I'm going to teach you how to make a six-figure business. I'm going to show you how you can build a profitable blog or make money in your sleep with affiliate marketing. And when you don't do those things, it's like you're the problem. You didn't show up. You didn't do the work. You have limited mindset beliefs. And the thing is, Maybe the program just doesn't work. Maybe this isn't for you, right? Maybe there's a different way that you can package and leverage your skills to build a business around you instead of what other people tell you that you should create. And so to me, I still feel like Vanessa has not realized that she was manipulated into thinking that she had to have all these things. And so it's a lot of self-blaming. And she's saying, this is my fault. I made my, I came up with these barriers in my head. You didn't come up with these in your head. This came from being a part of communities that manipulate their target audience in order to get them to buy more things, to sign up for masterminds, to sign up for coaching programs that you, you like, and I, I, I explain it like this to, to my clients a lot. I will tell them, all, I, I would have clients come to me, especially when Clubhouse first came out, y'all. I hated Clubhouse because my clients would go sit in these rooms and then they come back. Oh, I was on a panel with this person and they said I need to have a course. I was on a panel with this person. They said that you should have a group coaching program. And I had to explain to them, listen regardless of who you are listening to, they have a product or service that they are trying to sell. And in order for them to sell that, they are going to position their product or service as the vehicle to get you to where you want to be. If you want more time freedom, you want financial freedom, this is how you can get there with affiliate marketing. And that person just happens to have an affiliate marketing course. If you want to be able to live where you want to live, you can start your own online business. Hey, I have a course that will teach you how to start your online business. So they are going to position the vehicle that they sell as their products and services as the thing that can get you to the life or the goals or the dreams or desires that you have. Stop falling for these manipulative marketing tactics. So I'm not blaming anyone that I met. I'm not blaming any mentor. I'm not blaming any clients. I'm not blaming anyone but myself of putting you should be blaming them me through that pain and through that unrealistic standard. It was just me self-sabotaging or me just going through it as you can hear from the video. Our manipulation. All at the same time, I had no idea that I was gaining a bunch of weight. I was stress eating all the time. I spent more time caring about my clients and, you know, my audience than I did my actual friends and family. I was normalizing my anxiety. I thought it was normal in a part of entrepreneurship to have heart palpitations in the middle of the night and to just have all this irritation and all this anger in me. And it was also increasing my expenses like crazy. I had to go get me some more coffee, y'all. Vanessa is wearing me out. that I created in my head. And so I'm not blaming anyone that I met. I'm not blaming any mentor. I'm not blaming any clients. I'm not blaming anyone but myself of putting me through that pain and through that unrealistic standard. It was just me self-sabotaging or me just going through it as you can hear from the video. 
all at the same time, I had no idea that I was gaining a bunch of weight. I was stress eating all the time. I spent more time caring about my clients and you know, my audience than I did my actual friends and family. I was normalizing my anxiety. I thought it was normal in a part of entrepreneurship to have heart palpitations in the middle of the night and to just have all this irritation and all this anger in me. And I was also increasing my expenses like crazy. What used to be a really fun and profitable and lean business all of a sudden turned into this monster that I had to keep running and keep going in order to keep the lights on. And so what I realize now is that I got caught up in this second trap. And that is the scale trap. Now, some of you guys might not know what the scale trap means, and I don't blame you because it's a term that I made up. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about this scale trap because this is something that is also very common that a lot of people don't talk about. And once you start growing your business, a lot of coaches will mismanage their clients and ill-advise them that, okay, if you want to be able to grow, now you need to scale, you need to start building a team, you need to start hiring full-time employees, contractors, whatever. And I like to call it um, scale creep, right? Where as you're scaling, you're starting to implement all these new systems and tools, you're hiring contractors, employees, you're um, starting to pay all these additional expenses. And before you know it, if you are not on top of your finances, if you're not tracking your expenses, your income, your revenue, you can be making $20,000 per month. But if you're spending $25,000 per month in expenses, you are not profitable. You are hustling backwards. A lot of people don't pay enough attention to their money, how much money is coming in, how much money is going out to actually be able to scale effectively and efficiently. And if you are, if you have a business that has hockey stick growth, the first thing that I always think about is like, if you say, okay, I made seven figures in one year, how much of that was that revenue? Was that sales? Was it income? And if it's income or sales, how much did you actually profit? Did you turn a profit? Because oftentimes what people will do in their marketing message, they'll say, I made a six figure business or I had a six figure month and they are talking about sales. They made a hundred K in sales, but that does not account for their expenses. That doesn't account for them, just their overhead costs. That doesn't account for the contractors that they had to pay for. And oftentimes even Facebook ads, cause I know I worked with a specific coach who talked about how she made $25,000 in one month and when you actually look at the breakdown, yeah, she had 25K in sales, but she only actually made about $8,000 in revenue because she spent, I want to say like $12,000 on ads or something. And then you have other expenses as well, right? And so that's something that you, if you're thinking about working with a coach, you need to be mindful about the marketing messages that you're receiving and really look into those numbers if people are marketing based on income. But then even in your own business, you should be tracking every aspect of your business, everything that's coming in, everything that's going out, so you know exactly what your net profit or loss is. I remember being a part of a mastermind where the coach was saying, once you get to the six-figure mark, you need to start hiring employees. And I'm like, that is the craziest, wildest advice you can give anybody because as someone who it used to be a HR professional, I know that the biggest expense that most corporations and companies have is their employees because with full-time employees, you're not only paying salaries, you also have to cover benefits, insurance, and things like that. So if you hire an employee when you're making $100,000 a year, you can eat up thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 of that easily just by hiring one full-time employee. And so those are things that you have to think about. And that is the scale trap. Now, some of you guys might not know what the scale trap means and I don't blame you because it's a term that I made up. It reminds me of lifestyle creep. You know, lifestyle creep when you start making money, so you start spending more to maintain a certain image. Maybe you upgrade your car, you upgrade your house, or you upgrade your clothes, and then all of a sudden you have so many lifestyle expenses that you have to keep up. And so you have to keep working really hard in order to even maintain your life or the image that you're trying to portray. 
And so the scale trap, or maybe we could call it the scale creep, is the same thing, but applied to business. Because for me, what I didn't realize was that adding more team members meant adding more expenses. It meant feeling more pressure and more responsibility to keep this machine running. So no longer was I only creating videos because I felt like it, because I thought it was fun. It was now in the set. That's crazy. Um, in this screenshot, and you know, it's kind of cut off so you can't see the full thing. But in the screenshot that's posted, it says that her expenses was $393,000, which is crazy. And this is something that happens a lot. So even like I just said, like a little bit before this, even though she had this seven figure business, you're spending almost 40% of that is expenses. If not more. To show up every single day. And yes, that's great accountability. But sometimes with that pressure, it can be really stressful. Not only this, I remember uh, at the time I launched a mastermind. And I launched this mastermind, yes, to challenge myself, but to also to stick it to people and prove to people that I... Now, I just want to ask a question. I don't know how old Vanessa Lau is even now. But to... I know she said she started her business. She was in her early 20s. So, I personally... How could Vanessa Lau have, have a mastermind, Right what is she masterminding people for? Like, is she teaching people how to grow on YouTube, how to grow on Instagram? Maybe I could see as like, if you're masterminding about content creation, okay, maybe. But if you have a mastermind and it's about like growing a business, scaling a business, I don't feel like Vanessa Lau had that expertise. Like she herself was still trying to figure things out and it sounds like she relied heavily on the guidance and mentorship of whoever her mentors were, were right? So if you have this isolated view and perception of how you can actually grow and scale your own business, you should not be coaching and telling other people how to start businesses of their own. That's crazy to me. And then also, this is just a whole sidebar gripe that I have with the coaching industry. Yeah, oh, went on my glasses. So like a gripe that I have with the coaching industry in general when it comes to masterminds, a lot of these masterminds that are, you know, $10,000, $12,000, $20,000 aren't even masterminds. They are literally high level glorified Q and A sessions. A real mastermind is when you get a small group of people in a room and you guys can talk about what your business roadblocks, your challenges, obstacles that you're facing. And the people in the room can say, okay, this is the problem that you ha you're having. Here are some solutions. And what you see in a lot of masterminds is literally people will have kind of like a one hour workshop where they teach you something. Maybe it's a Q&A session where you have 50 people in this mastermind and only three people get to present their question. That is not a mastermind. <laughs> that is a high level coaching group. It is a glorified Q&A session. And I tell people all the time, I remember when I was in Singapore, I literally went to a mastermind that I paid $30 for. And it was probably one of the best mastermind experiences that I ever had because it followed the true mastermind format where you present a problem, the people in the room give you solutions, they help you come to the solution that is best for you are different options that you can consider in order to overcome the challenges or problems that you're having. And I literally paid $30 for that. And I, t I told the host, I was like, girl, people are charging five figures for this type of content and level of access and mastermind back in the States. And so it's interesting to me, like I said, it was only $30 and it was a true mastermind experience where you have people charging tens of thousands of dollars and it's nothing more than a Q and A session. And prove to people that I could do something outside of just a digital course. I could, I could sign high ticket clients, but that came with a lot more stuff that I didn't even expect. By launching this mastermind, it came with now event planning. It was suddenly an event planner for my business. It came with me doing sales calls and hiring a sales team and now having people working for commission, meaning that in order for these salespeople to get paid, I need to keep enrolling clients every single month. And so it kind of snowballed into a lot of things that I wasn't expecting. And I'm not a fan of the whole um, having people work commission-based to get you clients. 
because basically you're saying that they're not going to make money unless they sign clients for your program. And there's so many different factors that goes into whether or not someone signs up for your coaching program. So you can have someone who spends eight hours of their day, let's say they do um, two 30 minute uh, discovery calls per hour, that's 16 calls per day, and they don't enroll anyone into your program. Are you saying they're not going to get paid for that eight hours that they just worked? Absurd. And so all this to say is that I fell into the scale trap. And again, this all comes back from me not knowing what was enough for me. And because I didn't know what was enough, like I said, I just kept pushing for more to the point where I broke. I couldn't handle the scale anymore. This business had turned into something that I didn't even recognize anymore. And suddenly I was in this hamster wheel. And because I had this team and I had all this responsibility, it felt like I couldn't stop. And so it felt like I woke up one day and I just realized like, holy shit, I traded my nine to five for a 24 seven. And beyond that, another reason why I felt like I couldn't stop was because I fell into this third trap and it's the sunk cost trap. I felt like I had dug myself in this hole and there was no way getting out because I already committed and said yes to so many people because I'd already promised so many people so many things because I already put my image on the line. And so I feel like there's still something missing. So I understand her feeling like she got to a point to where she hadn't built the business that um, she wanted and she didn't recognize the business that she had anymore. I think I said that like a couple clips back or whatever. But even with that... I feel like she's still leaving out what got her to her breaking point. There's definitely a piece that's missing in there that could, could bridge that gap. With people that, hey, I'm launching this thing or I have these things going on. It felt embarrassing to stop. And of course, there's a human aspect of it. I don't want to be that person that lays people off all the time because she can't figure her shit out. It fucking sucks. I hate letting people go and I hate bringing people's hopes up only to shatter them because I just don't know my shit. And I don't even think it was just about me being afraid of letting the team down. It was also me being afraid of letting my clients down and not just any clients, but high ticket clients. When I launched my mastermind, it was my first time even signing high ticket clients. Like I had never had clients pay me 15, 20, 25, 30 grand to work with me. And so with that price point, especially for the first time came a lot of pressure that I put on myself of wanting to roll out the VIP experience and commit to more things than I would have liked. Let me know in the chat, would you pay Vanessa Lau 30 grand to participate? I, I had to look up this mastermind. I don't even know what it was about. But would you give Vanessa Lau 30 grand to coach you or mastermind with you? That seems crazy to me because she doesn't seem like someone who was experienced enough to be charging people $30,000 um, to coach them in any capacity. That's just absurd to me. For example, I promised and committed to epic speakers at all of our upcoming events. And that put this expectation that I would bring a speaker every single time, which then led me to saying yes to every single speaking engagement that I was invited to, because in the back of my mind, I knew that I would need speakers to my events. So Why do you need a door, speaker at a mastermind? Speaker. It's a mastermind. You're supposed to be masterminding. Overcommitted in terms of the number of events and the scale of events that we would have for this mastermind. And so that also became pretty scary. I also overcommitted on the number of coaching calls that I would offer. I think I offered pretty much a coaching call every single week, including coaching calls for our clients as team members. Um, and that was a lot for me. I bit off more than I could chew, realizing now that I had a YouTube channel that I wanted to grow. I had a team that I needed to manage. This was a new offer that I was running. We were still managing the Boss Graham Academy and we have this mastermind going on. And so I really dug myself in this hole. And at the time I felt like I couldn't retract and I felt like I couldn't reduce the scope because I had already promised. And a lot of times we talk about under promising and over delivering. And I wanted to continue that notion of even if I've overcommitted, I still need to make sure that if we have a speaker, it's one of the best speakers that we could ever find. Um, if I have an event, it's gotta be, you know, this epic thing with an after party with, you know, all these bells and whistles. If I'm gonna have these calls, not only am I gonna have a call for you as a client, but I'm gonna make sure we have calls for your team so your team feels supported. And so you can see that it just snowballed into a lot of commitments that I didn't realize at the time that I overextend myself on. But despite that, I kept pushing forward because I didn't want to disappoint anyone and I didn't want to ruin my reputation. I think there was also this pressure of, oh my goodness, like I haven't launched a program in three, four years. And so this is the first program that I'm launching that's not the Boss Grand Academy. And so it better be epic. I better uphold myself to a certain standard that I think that other people are expecting of me. And so as you can see, that's just a lot of pressure on one person um, that was obviously all self-induced. But anyways, at the time, I felt like I just couldn't stop. I don't know Vanessa Lau, but honestly, it just seems like she should just be a content creator and not try to have this like business and especially a business around coaching where you're coaching other people. Just create content, be inspired, tap into your creativity and be a YouTuber, right? Be a content creator where you can create the things that you want and leverage that to, you know, get brand deals, 
to grow your influence, you know, really tap into that influencer bag. And even at the beginning of this, she said she wanted to be a social media influencer. Just be a social media influencer and influence. And so having the sunk cost bias really prevented me from stopping sooner, even though it didn't feel good anymore. And it was a big reason why I just kept going until obviously you guys know I couldn't do it anymore. Now, at the beginning of the video, you already know that I ended up leaving and I did end up taking that break. And so what exactly was the straw that broke the camel's back? Because now I'm talking about how I couldn't stop and I felt so much pressure, but I kept moving and I kept pushing. Well, the reason why I actually decided to have finally the courage to stop everything was I just no longer felt like it was an integrity for me to keep things running the way that I was doing it. I found myself caught in, I guess, the last trap and that is the identity trap. I mentioned this countless times in this video. I just realized I just didn't know who I was anymore. I couldn't find me in my business anymore. For example, when I looked at my content, honestly, all I could see was freaking Alex from Ozzy. Because at some point in the game, he was an up and comer, now he's huge, but he was kind of like the standard for how your reels and how your content should look like. And so I edited my videos to be just like Alex's. Even if you look at like my quote posts and stuff, it looks like Dan Coe's because Dan Coe was an up and coming creator and now is huge. And so I always felt like I needed to replicate other people's success instead of recognizing that I'm paving my own path and that I have my own identity. Actually, I would like to make a quick correction on that. I wasn't always like that. I wasn't always someone that wanted to copy other people and replicate, you know, what's working for them. But somewhere along the lines, I started to be that person. I started to be that person I told myself I'd never be. And that was because I had higher expectations. Maybe the competition felt more fierce or maybe my scarcity mindset was, you know, a lot stronger than it was back then. Maybe I was just so afraid of losing my success. So I was willing to cut corners or just like, I just paid more attention to other people and what they were doing instead of just focusing on my damn self. When I look back at, my old, you know, my old stuff, it just felt so much more authentic because I was just being me. Like my stories were just unhinged. And then all of a sudden down the line, I started to censor myself more. I stopped being me. I stopped swearing in my videos. I stopped being like, just sharing personal aspects of my life. That I was like, thought was funny. Like I just stopped having a sense of humor. Like it was just insane in the membrane. And so that's why I want to clarify. I don't actually think that my entire journey was like that. It was kind of near the tail end of it where I started to like, pay way more attention to my quote unquote competitors and what everyone else was doing, which ultimately led me to losing my own identity the identity that made me successful in the first place. Another reason why I realized I couldn't see myself anymore was I just worked with so many mentors and consultants. I was working with Sam Ovens, who was helping me with the mastermind and I followed his blueprint of starting a mastermind. But when I looked at the mastermind, all I could see was Sam Ovens. And I love the guy, he's amazing. He's so smart. One of the best mentors I've ever had. But all I could see was Sam Ovens. <laughs> was he really the best mentor if, that you ever had if you ended up dissolving your business? And so this is Vanessa, Nessa child, Vanessa, Nessa girl, listen. You, yeah, I think eventually Vanessa will come out and make another follow-up reflection video when she really thinks about, you know, what led her to being in a position to where she wanted to just walk away from her business. Even in this video, she is still blaming herself and talking about how great Sam Ovens is, how great, um, what's his name, Alex Hermosi, Hermosi, whatever, is and how these mentors helped her but she's not realizing that when you have these cookie cutter mentors who can only do things one way and only teach things in one style then basically what they're doing is creating a whole bunch of mini versions of themselves and i'm pretty sure vanessa was doing the same thing with her own program she probably just created a whole bunch of mini vanessa's because that is the blueprint that she followed herself with her own mentors. So when you look at her channel, you no longer see Vanessa Lau. You see, I guess, Alex Hermosi was her mentor. When you look at her mastermind, it was basically just a copy and paste of Sam Ovens. And that is what I see with a lot of these coaches. Honestly, I've never taken a class or a program or anything by, um, what is her name? Um, Marie Forleo. Forleo. I've never taken anything by Sam Ovens. But when you, I see certain content online, when I see certain programs come out, I can tell, oh, that person went to B-School, that person worked with Sam Ovens, that person came from this coach's academy or school or whatever because of the language that they use, because of the content that they put out, because of the messaging that they have, I can pretty much tell where that coach got their coaching from, if, if that makes sense. And Vanessa has fallen into that same trap to where she basically just replicated 
and reproduce, repackage the things that she learned from her coach. She created a mastermind that was similar to Sam Ovens. She created YouTube reels and content similar to Alex Hermosi or whatever. And so instead of her having her own identity, she has now taken on these other people's identity because she thinks, oh, that's what's working. This person is scaling, so I have to do the same thing. And the thing that helps you to stand out online is you being your authentic self, you tapping into your own creativity, your own bag, and just trusting yourself. This is something that I had to teach myself in my own business. Like early on when I first started coaching, I typically just did whatever my coach told me to do. And then I had to realize that, you know what? That's not my marketing style. That's not how I am. I remember I took um, Danielle Leslie's course from scratch. And in that program, Danielle is very transactional. <laughs> it's all about the sales and the receipts, right? And so her... Teaching is basically telling you go flex on Instagram, use how much money you've made in your business to encourage other people to work with you so that they can duplicate your success. And so when I use that marketing style that I learned from the program, it felt really uncomfortable for me because it wasn't natural for me, but then also it impacted the type of clients that I attracted as well. Instead of me attracting the clients who were purpose-driven, who wanted to have a long-lasting, meaningful impact, create things that, you know, enhance the quality of life of people in society, all of a sudden, all of the clients that I was attracting were clients who were transactional and money focused and they didn't care how they made money online they just wanted to make money in the fastest way possible so that's why you have to be careful when you're choosing a mentor don't just go look at someone and say oh this person has a large following this person is making this money and i want to do it too let me work with them find someone who is in alignment with your core principles and who you are as a person, someone who if you're transactional and you only want transaction based money, make money, find someone who teaches that. If you're the type of person you're like, you know what, I'm not about that hustle culture. I'm not about the, the making money online and using income claims and flexing on the gram. Find you someone who doesn't do that stuff. Find someone who is in alignment with the things that you believe, the beliefs that you have the values that you have. Um, when I looked at my YouTube channel, at one point I hired a consultant, Drew Hitchcock. He helped me look at my analytics and A-B test things on my channel to the point where some of these thumbnails were not even my creation. We're not even from me and my team. It was his team A-B testing a bunch of things and seeing what worked and seeing what didn't work. Every week we would have a meeting and he would critique my videos and tell me what I needed to tweak because remember at that point I was so like stressed and I had so many things on my plate that I needed and I relied heavily on coaches and consultants to tell me what the fuck to do and to take a lot of that load off. And so it got to a place where even when I looked at my YouTube channel, it didn't really feel like me anymore. So you have Vanessa admitting here that she had mentors, coaches, and consultants who were basically telling her what to do it all the time. And it sounds like she didn't really have a lot of agency over her own business. And she just relied on other people to tell her what to do. But here she is in her own right, or not own right, but she's serving in a capacity to where she's coaching and mentoring other people when you don't even have the expertise and wisdom for how to market your own business and there's nothing wrong with having coaches and mentors and things like that to help you in your business sometimes you're so close to your business you need that third party non-judgmental person that can come in and help you see the things that you don't see or help you navigate certain challenges but at the end of the day they should be there to kind of help guide you and not just tell you do x y z it should be a collaborative effort and so Vanessa shouldn't be in a place where she's coaching other people when she can't even coach herself. And this is one why I tell my clients all the time, before you even start hiring a team, you should do everything in your business yourself that you can. If this is like, you can't build a website, hire a website, right? Someone to build a website for you. But when you know 
how everything in your business works, it's a lot easier for you to number one, hire a team, bring in consultants because you're familiar with everything that's going on and you can say, okay, like this is where I'm at. This is where I want to go. This is how I want to do it. And then that person can come in and just, you know, support you with your vision of where it is that you want to go. But when you don't have your own vision, when you don't have your own kind of like wisdom about the things that you're creating and the things that you're doing in your business, then it's easy for someone to come in and then get you off course for where it is that you thought you wanted to go. And then they take you down a completely different path. All I could see was my YouTube consultant Drew. And when it came to my mastermind, I felt hella out of integrity running it because I felt like I was just basically teaching people. It wasn't things. a mastermind. I really about my business. The fact that I was scaled up so much. Yes, I was making a lot of money, but I was also not very happy. And so it felt super out of integrity running that mastermind. And when it came to my course, the Boss Grammar Academy, the course that my it was millions uh, that I was able to achieve in that short period of time, it honestly, when I looked at it, it felt like I was looking at 2019 Vanessa. I am no longer that same person that started that course, yet I was continuing running it, even though I no longer felt like it was really me and a reflection of who I am today. And of course, yes, the course still gives people results and it's still that blueprint to earning money online when you're starting out, but it's just no longer what I want to be known for. And then finally, with my team, I was just tired of being an asshole. And what I mean by that is that, yes, I could have kept my business running, I could have kept it operating as I figured things out but through my experience i learned that when i'm trying to figure things out and i'm throwing spaghetti at the wall all it creates is collateral damage i've documented my journey of hiring employees then firing them then descaling then scaling again and all of this is because i was always pivoting and trying to like make these decisions really quickly and trying to figure things out and yes it was because i had the pressure of employees of course i wanted to make sure i had the answers for everyone but it is so hard to actually think things through thoughtfully and to do things thoughtfully when you have that type of pressure. And my experience tells me that when you are being reactive and you're doing all these things, like I said, it creates collateral damage. It creates this reality where you have to let people go because you accidentally overhired or you hired the wrong position because you're not clear on what the fuck you want. Ultimately, I finally found the courage within myself to shut things down because I no longer felt like I was in integrity with myself and to others. I didn't like how I was treating other people. I didn't like who I was becoming. I didn't like how I was living. And so within that month, when I had that realization, first I told my team and I had to basically have conversations back to back to back to back trying to explain something that I didn't really know fully how to explain but to express how apologetic and sorry I am for having to make this decision but also letting them know that ultimately this is the best for both parties I had to pay out all the severance packages that all my employees were entitled to I let my mastermind clients know what was going on and I refunded all of them especially considering the fact that it was a mastermind that was really only running for like a month before it had to shut down I that's crazy but kudos to you Vanessa like kudos for you choosing yourself, you know, it takes courage. So I don't know how this video is going to come off. I know there's probably going to be people in the comments that are going to be like, you're just jealous. Whenever I do reaction or review videos like this, there are still people that are caught in the fog that haven't had that epiphany moment yet about the coaching industry that are just going to talk about, I'm just jealous and all of these other things. But a lot of times in the coaching industry, there is this group think mentality. It's very cultish. And when you fail or have experienced some type of failure, people will blame it on you. You didn't do the work. You didn't show up, right? And so it takes courage to be able to come out and say, you know, this isn't the this isn't the vision I have for my business and I had to let it go. And to be, I still feel like she's, you know, not telling the full story and she's holding some things back. But even the things that she is sharing, the reflections that she has had, it takes courage to be able to share those things, especially on a public platform where people are going to judge you and you're going to be up for scrutiny. So I commend her for that. I discontinued selling the Bossgram Academy. And by the way, throughout my sabbatical, I continued running Bossgram Academy and I still hopped on monthly calls with my clients. And that was basically the only thing that I kept during my sabbatical was continuing to hop on the calls until the last person no longer had access to those calls. All those things I ended up doing. So it's interesting that she closed down her business. She started a math mastermind. A month later, she ended up dissolving her business after one month of running her mastermind. She shut down the mastermind. Um, but continued to do the coaching calls for Boss Graham Academy. So I feel like the breaking point has something to do with the mastermind. 
um maybe she didn't feel qualified maybe someone was like this ain't no mastermind because that would have been me if i pay somebody thirty thousand dollars for a mastermind and i show up and there's a powerpoint slide and there's guest speakers i'm gonna be like what are we doing i'm here to mastermind i'm having this roadblock in my business i need to be able to talk this out with somebody if i go to a mastermind and there's a powerpoint slide it's a no for me person no longer had access to those calls all those things i ended up doing and then I, I put up this post and that was that and i decided to like delete social media the moment i posted it because i didn't want other people's opinions to make me regret my decision and to this day i do not regret my decision and the reason why i don't regret the decision even though it was really painful in the moment and i probably disappointed a lot of people is because it was finally a decision that i made for me it wasn't a decision that i felt pressured into it wasn't a decision that i was constantly thinking about like how would this look or what about this person or what about that or how about this it was finally a decision that i made for myself and it was weirdly enough really empowering i said no to a lot of people i was booked to speak at a lot of big events and i had to email them and tell them never mind i'm pulling out i realized that there is power in that and that is why i just don't regret it and in fact in the past year i've had a lot of time to reflect as you can tell from this video but i also had a lot of time to spend with my loved ones and through that process of just living life without the pressure of social media, I was able to learn a really valuable lesson. And that is, I am enough. I am dope. I am cool. I've done cool shit. I am awesome. And it took me a year of being off of social media to realize that. And this is who I've been all along. And by the way, I hope I'm not sounding arrogant or self-absorbed. I just really want to highlight this transformation that I've gone through. You know, yes, we could argue that I just probably didn't have enough experience to handle the scale and the growth that I had. Uh, I probably Bingo. could have done a few strategic hires. But the truth of the matter is, at the heart of it, I just never felt worthy. I didn't have that sense of enoughness. During my sabbatical, though, not only did I find my sense of enoughness through being alone, learning about myself, and through reflection, but it also came from hanging out with friends and family who love me for me. You know, these are the people that have known me even before I was successful, even before I made money, even before I had this YouTube channel. And it allowed me to just show up as myself and understand that I can still be accepted by being me. And there's this book that I, I read during my sabbatical. It's called The Courage to Be Disliked. It's a really good book. I really liked it. Oh, Vanessa, I'm so glad you had that experience and that revelation. Um, when you build a business around your personal brand, you do kind of lose focus, right? And you can lose your identity. So I'm glad she was able to kind of reclaim her identity and, and spend quality time with her family and friends and the people in the real world who love you unconditionally. So, so often people look for validation on social media and it's not real, right? People will turn on you in an instant. I know for me, like I've, I've hired so many YouTube managers who, um, like when I'm growing my channel, they would tell me, oh, like hop on trends or do this and do that, use this title. And I'm like, I understand that those things are very clickbaity. They can go viral. They can get you more clicks and views. But at the end of the day, I'm not chasing popularity. I don't want people to just watch my channel to watch my channel. I want to only have content that shows to people that it's going to mean something too and if that's only a hundred people i'm good with that if it's a thousand people i'm good with that i'm not looking to get um tens of thousands of followers and all this like i always tell people all the time like when we all um experience life differently we are all a constellation of our own education wisdom and experiences and we are all pastors in our own capacity right so we all have our pulpit of people who are going to resonate with the reason why we are here on this earth you don't have to go out and try to convince people or build your own audience the people that are meant to connect with you um will find you your, your pulpit will find you and he talks about vertical relationships, vertical relationships, and horizontal relationships. And what vertical relationships mean is that when you see every single relationship as vertical, meaning that there's always someone above you, it's going to create a lot of pressure on yourself to want to constantly please, to perform, to, you know, change yourself, to be liked. Whereas if you start seeing every single relationship as a horizontal relationship, you see everyone as an equal, then you will feel more permission to just show up as you are. And you'll learn that valuable lesson of, hey, if I show up as I am, that is enough. It also allowed me to understand what non-transactional relationships look like. Uh, when I hung out with my friends and family, you know, 
these were people that weren't necessarily relying on me to pay their salaries. They weren't people that wanted tips and resources from me. They, they didn't want anything from me. They just, they just wanted me to hang out with them and to, to be me. I want to share this story with you because I think it's such a valuable lesson that I learned and it's a simple shift that we can all make. You know, when I look at my audience now, I see you guys as equals. I no longer see myself as, you know, someone who needs to constantly please you all to constantly have this community hovering around me, above me, um, feeling like I need to take every single feedback and that I need to change the heart of what I want to do to please all these people. When I am networking and I'm talking to someone, I'm no longer seeing them as being better than me or below me. I'm seeing them as equals, which gives me that freedom to myself. be myself. Vanessa, and not this like sounds like you're getting yourself thing, back into like the same cool hamster wheel that you just so, talked again, about getting out of. Really are, you um, really are you turn? Are you currently just, just taking the ideologies that you read in this and book and now you are adopting this as your own thinking? Because that's what it sounded like to me, girl. Business together, and when that's ready, I can't wait to reveal what it is. I traveled a shit ton only to realize that hey, maybe. Actually, my home is awesome. I don't want to move anywhere else. I love my home. Home is where the heart is. I learned to just appreciate the things I have. I slowed down and actually thought about my accomplishments. And again, like I said, tooting my own horn, realized how epic I am. I've always been. I can't believe that I made myself feel like I was never good enough. I also was able to develop a lot more healthier habits. I cannot believe that I like going to the gym now and I cook for myself and I eat pretty healthy and I prioritize my wellness. And so now coming back to social media, I feel like I've developed a lot of cool skill sets that I didn't have before. I feel like I got to learn more about who I am and what my values are. Like I said earlier in the video, keep in mind when I started my business, I was in my early 20s and being in my early 20s, I had a whole set of different values. I valued money, I valued grinding, I valued doing everything I could to get everything that I wanted because when I was in my early 20s, I didn't have anything. I wasn't rich, I was like middle class, but I wasn't rich. And there was a lot of things that rich people had that I wanted. And so I was willing to do anything to get those things, only to realize that when you get those things, it doesn't really matter. What matters is your health, what matters are your relationships, what matters is your happiness. And so now as I'm entering my 30s, I've just learned that I have a whole new set of values. And that's why I'm really excited to be back because now I get to almost like rebuild my business with these new values that I've identified for myself and that I've learned about myself. And I have a feeling, even though I don't have all the answers of what the future is gonna look like, I just have this strong feeling that I'm gonna feel a lot better and I'm gonna be a lot happier. And I already am a lot happier. And ultimately I am just grateful. And with that gratitude, I also wanna say I'm grateful for you, for you watching this video. Whether you are someone who just supports my content, whether you were a past team member, whether you were a past client, whether you were a past mentor, I wanna say thank you for being a part of my journey. It was not perfect and it was messy, but so many of you held patience and empathy for me. And I really appreciate that. I'm really grateful for that. And I would also like to say I'm so grateful for those of you who actually reached out to me during my Yes, being a creator is awesome, Vanessa. Just be a content creator and don't worry about doing all the other things. You can be a great content creator and not be a coach, not sell physical products, not have a mastermind and do the other things. Just create and do what you're good at. I personally... I personally believe there is a huge difference between being a content creator and being an entrepreneur. They are not the same thing. You have some content creators who can be successful entrepreneurs and you have some entrepreneurs who are also content creators, but there's also a very distinct difference between the two including how you feel day to day in your business, including how you show up in your content. And I really hope that by you watching this video, you're able to kind of see what can happen when you lose yourself in this process, but also to see what can happen when you find yourself again. And even though there is so much information on the internet on how your business should look like, whether you're growing and scaling and being a CEO or treating it like a side hustle or trading it like a single person solopreneur business, I want you to know that there are so many different paths to success, but there is only one path that is uniquely for you. And I hope that you have the courage to do that path, to do that path that feels good to you, that makes sense for the life that you want, for the values that you have. And if you are someone who is unclear on those values, who is unclear on what you actually want, I hope that this video gives you courage to actually just pause. You don't have to quit, but you can pause to slow down and to reflect and to get to know who you are because your values are gonna change over time. Like I said, my values in my early 20s is so different from the values that I have now. And it's important that when you are creating your career or creating your life or creating whatever you wanna create, that you have that stop point to actually ask yourself, if that business model, if that career, if that relationship, if that whatever it is that you're doing matches the values that you have today. And so with that being said, what is next for me? Well, if it isn't obvious enough, I still want to create. I still want to be a part of this creator economy and you know share content that is helpful for creators like myself. Uh, I no longer really have content pillars and instead I have core principles that my life revolves around, but also I have a feeling my content is going to revolve around. So for example, the four core pillars that I have is to feel good. I really prioritize my wellness and my health now and also my sense of being. And so I can see me sharing how I'm doing that in hopes that maybe you can find balance in your life. I want to have fun. I want to share more aspects of my life, more aspects to myself. So it doesn't always feel like I'm trapped in a niche and instead I'm able to share my interests freely to my audience. And again, I would love to share my process of how I'm doing that with you guys. I want to do less. You know, my path to success was so complicated. It used to be 
be simple, but then it got complicated over time. And so I really want to share an easier way to doing content creation, to starting an online business, to being a creator. And so I'm really excited to share my lessons on that as I document my journey of simplifying. And I also want to earn not just more, but earn enough. Throughout my time off, I was able to understand what enoughness looked like for me. And I no longer have crazy, crazy huge revenue goals because I know what enough looks like. Looks like. Oh, that makes me smile. That makes me smile because I have this conversation a lot because with social media, you have all of this messaging around um, building six and seven figure businesses, but you can be a small business owner and you can have a business making $60,000, $70,000 and still be successful, right? I hate the fact that people have kind of put these label on what it means, these labels about what it means to be successful on if you hit a specific revenue mark, you hit a specific sales uh, mark in your business. You don't have to have make six figures to have a impactful, successful business that helps people that also provides for your lifestyle. And so many people miss out on serving their customers because they're focused on the money because they're focused on the transactions instead of just focusing on showing up and serving people. When you have a product that is good, when you have a service that is good, it speaks for itself, it sells itself. And so if you want to be successful, all you have to do is, and this is so cliche, but if you want to be successful, all you have to do is solve a problem for a specific group of people in the world and you will be able to build a sustainable business. But I'm happy to see that she did have that revelation and she's restructuring her business about around having enough instead of just scaling to these massive um, revenue goals or even building a team are getting to a certain level in that aspect. And in addition to that, while I was away, I learned that, damn, I have such a cool job that has so many different potentials for different revenue streams. And so I want to be able to document my journey of unlocking those revenue streams and showing you guys what that happened. Wait, we're still unlocking revenues? Vanessa, I just went through all of this about having enough and you're still over here talking about unlocking revenue streams? Is one not enough? Girl, what, what you about to do? Are you about to launch a new business? You better not make a video after this and tell people about your new business, helping people build businesses that are just enough. You better not, Vanessa. You better not. What that path could look like in order for you to hit your enough number, in order for you to have that enoughness in your business. How can you earn enough to fuel your lifestyle? What does that lifestyle even look like? And what are the different cool revenue streams that you can unlock as a creator? And the reason why I keep emphasizing making money as a creator is because I recognize the amount of privilege that I had to be able to even take time off. To say that I was able to take a whole year off and have that flexibility and still earn income thanks to my passive revenue streams that I set up as a creator is amazing. Vanessa, I'm not liking where this is going. I'm not liking it, Vanessa. It seems like you're, you're doing the same thing again. You're falling into that same trap. Like you just had this whole epiphany and now you're basically repackaging your old ideologies into something new? I'm confused. And so I recognize how amazing this career can be. And so I have this renewed sense of purpose to wanting more people to tap into this awesome opportunity of being a creator. There are some creators that make more than doctors and surgeons and politicians and astronauts. It's, it's insane what this career can offer you. And so I want to be able to not just help you do it successfully, because we all know that even if you're successful, you can be unhappy and you can be miserable and you can- Vanessa, yourself. I don't know you, but just based on the things that I do know in this video alone, just be a content creator. Why do you feel like you have to create this business around being a content creator and unlock these different income streams? Like, just be a creator. Document your life. Yes, share your lessons and your discoveries. You, you know, inspire people through your own journey, but don't feel like you have to put yourself in a position where you're coaching people to do the same things that you're doing. You are literally repeating the same cycle that you just got out of in a different way. But to also do it in a sustainable way. And with my experience now that I've acquired of growing and scaling and now descaling and simplifying, I just feel like I have a lot to say about this subject. 
Not only this, I know that there are so many different avenues to making money as a creator now. There are some creators who- You can have a lot to say without charging other people for what you're gonna say. Make money and make millions of dollars with brand deals. Others only rely on affiliate marketing. Others sell courses. Others, you know, sell physical product. Others, you know, do a lot of- There's just so many different types of creators out there. And so I wanna be able to show you guys the potential of everything and for you to choose your own path and choose your own adventure of how you want to build your business model as a creator. Okay, I'm for people choosing their own path. We're on the same page with that. Creator. And so if any of those principles resonate with you or there's certain things that you'd like to learn or maybe you just wanna keep up with my journey, then make sure you hit that subscribe button because in my next video, I'm also going to be sharing the behind the scenes of what exactly happens to your social media platforms when you stop posting for an entire year. I remember when I took that break, I went to Google first thing and I was like, what happens to your channel when you stop posting? And all I got was a bunch of videos about creators quitting YouTube and not necessarily any information on what happens to your channel. And so make sure you hit that notification bell because in my next video, I'm gonna be sharing all that information. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys. All right, so Vanessa is back, <laughs> and with the recent uh, news of Vanessa. All right, so Vanessa is back. It will be interested to see where she goes from here. Um, based on this video, it sounds like I don't know. This is interesting. So what I gather from this is I feel like Vanessa is like you know her, she dissolved the other business and she's starting over building a new business, but. I feel like she couldn't just come back and not address the fact that she quit and then went on sabbatical and sabbatical and was gone for a year. So she knew, okay, I can't just come back to social media and not address the elephant in the room. I have to explain my abrupt abandonment of my business and then kind of let people know where I was at and why. But I also feel like she's still leveraging that as kind of like in the entrepreneur world, you have like the rags to riches story to where people will leverage that to get buy-in from people, right? And I feel like with this video, she is using this as kind of like, okay, this is my rags to riches. I built this seven-figure business. I didn't like it. And so I decided to get rid of it. And now I'm starting from scratch. But in this process, I feel like she's going to launch a new business, maybe around helping people, I don't know, self-care, um, understanding what enough is. But I feel like she's going to put herself back into the same cycle, which is really weird to me. Even in this video, as I'm watching this, yes, she's had a lot of aha moments and a lot of reflection about things that she did wrong maybe things she could have been done better but there's still a lot of self-blame that i necessarily don't feel comfortable with because a lot of the things that she's experienced is not because of someone who took on this identity on their own but you place yourself in these communities where people make you feel like you have to have all these things and these bells and whistles in your business you have to have the coaching programs and the masterminds in order to be successful and honestly i feel like vanessa still needs to take time to herself to figure out what her identity is what she wants things to look like for herself and just focus on that instead of even now based on this video i feel like she's looking at it like how can i monetize my sabbatical right and she's going to end up putting herself right back into the same situation but that is my thoughts that's my opinion i want to hear from you guys down in the comments below this video let me know what is your thoughts what do you think is going to be next for vanessa Lau? do you have any aha moments or reflections um even watching this let me know all of your thoughts comments and opinions down in the comments below this video this is my first time doing a reaction video like this but let me know if you want to see more videos like this me reacting to things i know this video is probably going to be a little bit long so if you watch all the way to the end kudos to you you the real mvp drop me a arm strong arm emoji in the comment section and let me know you made it to the end of this video as always, thanks so much for stopping by my internet home. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you'll be the first one to get notified anytime I upload another video just like this one. All right, bye, y'all.